If you have your Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 1. We'll be in verse 29 today. Verse 29 through 39. We're almost out of chapter 1. So last week we talked about the topic of demons, and this comes up a lot in Mark. Notice um, Jesus stirred them up. Uh, It's debated whether they're as prevalent as they were there. We don't know. There's mystery to that. Um, But naturally, when God's walking around in the flesh, uh, they come out. And we talked last week of how he had authority over them. And we'll see that again. We see lots of encounters uh, with demonic forces between Jesus and his showing his dominion over them, his his authority over them. And uh, I uh, mentioned last week, and one of the comments uh, I made in in passing, and this will talk more down the line. uh, We're not talking about demons specifically today. We're going to talk about a day in the life of Jesus uh, this morning, but um, one of the things I mentioned is how we need to be careful. Um, remember, one, that he's our king and he's our authority, and we go to him. If you feel like you're up against something bigger than you, which you will be and you are, all times, we, again, go back and listen to last week's sermons as we think about what's going on in the world, evil. I mean, what other wor- wor- word can you put on the things going on uh, with, with Russia and war and the, the, you know, the fear that we have because of Crazy men leading kingdoms, evil. It's beyond one man. Don't, don't you see that? Uh, that? That's how the scripture shows us that, that they work, uh, that the demonic forces work on those things, scheming of the devil. Uh, but, but I made the statement that we go to the king. You'll see, and we'll get to this, and I'll spend more time on it, but there in Mark 9, there's a demon encounter with the disciples, and they were casting out demons, the disciples were. And we're not necessarily given a prescription on how to do that or to do that. Um, But we are given Ephesians 6, the weapons of warfare that we put on the armor of God. We go to the king and Jesus told them, you can't do this one. Like this one's beyond you. You got to pray and fast. And and so I made a statement last week. I said, be careful that in Jesus name, you don't, you know, try to command. Uh, I don't remember how I said it. If you've done that with the right heart, it's okay. If you feel like you're up something uh, against something bigger than you uh, have at it, command that you have authority in the sense of you're, you're God's kid. You know, if you're walking with him, uh, uh, that, that you can say in, in Jesus' name, you know, pray that, but ultimately remember the, what I'm saying is pray. Um, let's not use God as a pawn. I'm, I'm disturbed when people get flippant with commanding God this, that, and the other especially like faith healer types. And that's what I was more alluding to. So you do have authority over them because he's your authority. Uh, So pray though, ultimately, and seek him. And we'll talk more uh, down the way as we come to Mark 5, Mark 9. There's more encounters uh, to be seen with Jesus dealing with demons. So let's look at Mark chapter 1 in verse 29. Let's stand and read together. So even the disciples who were holding apostolic power, uh, showing that they were God's guys and, 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 and they were walking with Jesus, they even encountered demonic forces that, again, Jesus said, you can't handle this. Who can handle them? Jesus can. So remember that when you are up something uh, against something large, something big, something dark, um, he's your king. He's your authority. And that's the premise I wanted you to Hang on last week, so let's move on. Verse 29 of Mark chapter 1. After Jesus left the synagogue with James and John, they went to Simon and Andrew's home. I love how this is just shooting through, again, a day in the life of Jesus. We're going from step here. He just cast out demons. Now he's moving on uh, to Simon and Andrew's home. Now Simon's mother-in-law was sick in bed with a high fever. They told Jesus about her right away. So he went to her bedside took her by the hand and helped her sit up. Then the fever left her and she prepared a meal for them. And wouldn't you just like to walk around with him and watch? It's just like, it's it's crazy. Verse 32. 
That evening, after sunset, many sick and demon-possessed people were brought to Jesus. The whole town gathered at the door to watch. So Jesus healed many people who were sick with various diseases, and he cast out demons. Remember, we talked last week of how these are not one and the same. That demonic oppression is a, a separate issue here. And he says, heal the sick, cast out demons. But because the demons knew who he was, he did not allow them to speak. It's just so, it's, it's, you're reading this just nonchalantly. Like we're dealing with demons. Jesus is like, that, you can't talk. Verse 35. Before daybreak, the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. Later, Simon and the others went out to find him. When they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. But Jesus replied, we must go on to the other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. That is why I came. So he traveled throughout the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. What a dude. What a man. What a God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for um, just the amazement of uh, just a snippet of, of minutes of your life and what you were doing, stirring up the world, stirring up the forces of evil. Uh, God, we have uh, different lenses on our eyes because you've opened them to see that um, this world is not in disarray because of men like Putin. This world is not dis in disarray because of places like North Korea. This world is in disarray uh, because of evil. And the ruler of principalities of darkness, Satan. But they have no authority over you. May we rest in that. May we rest in knowing that we know you. And greater is you that lives in us than he that is in the world. Uh, may we just find our hope and peace in that. In your name, amen. amen. And that is not the sermon today. That was last week uh, about evil. But I sense this, you know, it just the news ramps it up. Fear-mongering, Right? Sky is falling. So rest in that. Rest in last week's sermon. You're going to rest in Christ today. Uh, but today we're going to look more in a, in a day. And some of us need to just breathe because we can't focus on today because we're so worried. Who's going to click the red button, right? Uh, they they fear monger in us. And that's always the case. Again, we're in 2022. And you go, can it get worse? Um, I, one, yes, it can. <laughs> Two, read history. Um, and when I look at my, what my grandparents grew, grew up in, Great Depression, yeah, World War I, World War II, I mean, the world was at war. You think they weren't going, this is it, this is the big one, right? It's just sin. Can we not see that? It's evil. Babylon, Sodom and Gomorrah, it's the story of man, man ruling. So rest in Christ. He's good. He's got you. Uh, that was... Uh, the preface. Let's move into the text here, okay? I just kind of feel that this morning uh, because I guess, like I said, the news and we just had a hurricane. And so everyone breathe and let's focus in on what God has for us here. You'll notice a lot of demon activity again because Jesus was in the presence, the ultimate good was in the presence of evil in a sinful, broken world. So we'll see more of that. And as we look today, we're going to concentrate on this time and this moment in his day. Uh, what do you do with your days as we look at Jesus? I don't think we were doing that, right? Well, he just did. What do you do with your days? Like, so we just read about a snippet of time in, the, in, in, in Jesus' day, just a small moment. He heals this lady. Casting out demons, just boom, 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 boom. Now, Jesus, now let's look at Aaron. Let's look at Randy. <laughs> what are you doing with your days? How does that make you feel? What's that? <laughs> what do you do with your days? Well, listen, everything you do is shaped by your beliefs and your values. Hear me? Your beliefs, think about those words and what they mean. Beliefs, what you ultimately believe about everything. And the values, the things you hold tight to that matter in your life. They ultimately shape your actions. They shape your behaviors. 
Those two things, those core things in your life. We did this months back when we talked about worldview, what you believe. Everyone has beliefs and values that shape everything, the behaviors, what you do with your hands, what you do with your mouth. The actions you take are shaped by your beliefs and your values. So we'll be thinking about and pondering that today. Now, oftentimes, just because you believe something, there's a lot of churches who believe the same things we do, but they don't hold to the same uh, things in action, in environments. Uh, that's their values. So our values greatly shape us. We're going to be talking about us as individuals and as a church today. So just because we believe something, oftentimes our values will play more of a part than what our beliefs do uh, because we prioritize certain things. So think about that. Think about in your own life how you have these certain beliefs, but you have these values in your home and in your family that you hold to that don't necessarily line up perfectly with what you believe. So these both play into each other. Jesus' miracles of healing and feeding show that he was king over and concerned with the physical world. Hear that? The physical world, not just the spiritual. Therefore, Jesus here, as we see in this passage, is teaching and ministering in word and in deed. He heals. He teaches and he heals. And I don't want to pit both these against each other. We're going to move down the line and show how these two work together. Essentially, what comes to mind when I was studying this is, oh yeah, this is reminiscent of faith and works, book of James, right? That's not just our beliefs and our values, it's behavior too. These are all married together. So what you hold in your heart and what you value come out in the wash as you live your life. Faith indeed. So it's not necessarily one or the other. It's all of the above. Listen to me. This is, a, this is a big statement. We oftentimes pit physical world, spiritual world, or doing versus maybe even Bible study. Everything is spiritual. Everything is spiritual. We live in a naturalistic world that is... Uh, it's been secularized where we see the physical world, the spiritual world, and we want to science versus faith and all this. It's all God's. He made it. He made the molecules. He made the brain to think about these things. It's all God's. And sometimes we're thinking, again, this or that, and it's, we need to see them working together. Everything is spiritual. God is renewing all things. And this is huge. So I want you to get your head and heart around this. Scripture talks about us having new heavens, that he's going to make new heavens and new earth and renewed bodies, new bodies. Can I get an amen on that one? Those of you over 40. We, Amanda and I were having this conversation the other day. It's like, when does the body start tanking? And we looked it up. <laughs> we looked it up. It's, what it was at 26? It's grow, grow, grow. Now you're done. Just decline at, at 26. That's when the hair starts growing in your ears, guys. And, and Mark Lowry said it starts climbing from, from, uh, from your head to your back and in other places. So too much information there. So let's move along. Anyway, that God's making all things new. This is, this is uh, incredibly important in our beliefs and our values because this, this is unique to Christianity. That we don't believe this stuff is going to just blow away. That God is renewing all things. This gives dignity to humanity. This gives us, in fact, uh, that some people who just kind of treat Mother Earth as God and that's all there is, Christianity gives more value to Earth because he's making all things new. And we don't put it before God by any means, but we're to be stewards of his creation. And he's going to make all things new. Now, there's de debates within church history, and this is not pertinent, but I want to give this to you, whether... God's going to completely destroy, and this is a whole other sermon in itself, 
but this is not the point. So whether he's going to destroy or renew what is already here. Is he going to use it or is he going to destroy it? And there's different texts that people use to go back and forth. But no matter the case, we are now practicing what's to come. So it doesn't matter really. It doesn't matter if he uses the same matter, he makes new matter. That's not the point. We are practicing what's to come in the next world. That our eyes have been opened to practice getting back to the garden of how God created and designed things to be. We get the joy of practicing that, of being stewards of the creation he's given us, of dignifying humanity and seeing people as image bearers of Christ, not just robots in flesh, not just empty people without souls that just have this moment, but image bearers of God. We get to practice that spiritual renew, renewal through salvation. That God is working us over to be like that person we were meant to be and what we will be eventually in heaven. Complete. Not struggling with sin. Not struggling with disease and brokenness of this world. Not struggling with fear over that crazy man pressing the red button, right? The gospel is not just about you. You realize that? That, that, that? What we read in the scripture is cosmic. That God is making all things new. That we are a part of this great grand story. God is making everything new. And this should bring joy to heart. We're, we're part of those who have gone before us, those who will come behind us, this great family and, and him Restoring this world to the beauty that it was made to be. The second Adam will bring the new heavens, the new earth. And as the church, I want you to think about this. We are about teaching. We are about spiritual growth. That is important. So as we think about him, Jesus, again, in the physical world and valuing spiritual too, that sometimes we compartmentalize these things and we're just like, it's just about praying, it's about Bible studies, it's about growing. But the reaction to that is us doing, is us living this out, of us loving our neighbor as ourself, as a, of us putting this into practice with people in our lives, with the, the sphere of influence in our lives. And this affects our behavior by what we believe. As a church, teaching and the word and growth are important, but we react to that. If we just sit in classrooms and, and just say, this is just spiritual, we got to just grow. And we just read the Bible and all we do is pray, then it's just knowledge puffed up. We're sitting on our hands. As James said, faith without works is dead. Authentic faith brings reaction brings doing. And it's really something I've struggled with this because it's not something you really have to think about. You do have to make yourself, I mean, you do these, go through these processes in your mind of thinking and praying and saying, oh, the, the me's wanting to do nothing, and, 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 but God would want me to do this. Those battles go on in your head. But the battle goes on in your head because you love God. It happens that God leads you towards doing let me give you an example of this. Uh, we had a hurricane blow through last week. Y'all remember that? And uh, we, were, we were affected. Now, let me, let me just set this up. I'm using this as just an illustration. I am not complaining. Um, we had, you know, uh, we thought we were through it, and then a tree fell on my house. But there's people without homes right now, uh, people in much worse condition. In fact, this is not props to me. This is what, exactly what I'm talking about. It's, I've been having guys come out with the water machines and drying things up and dehumidifiers and, and all those guys. And one guy said to me, he's, as he was hanging out talking to Amanda and me, and he's like, I'm just glad to be around some people who are calm. <laughs> he said, you wouldn't believe the insanity right now. And yeah, it was just, it's just stuff, you know. It's just, he's just saying people with like minor things are freaking out. Um, so this just tells you people watch you. Got that? 
And I'm talking to this guy, building a relationship with this guy. I, I want to keep knowing him, and, and I'd love to have the guy at church some, at some point. So people pay attention. <laughs> people pay attention to your behavior. But all this to say, um, so we had, if you don't know, we had a tree come through our house like after it was done. We thought we were through. Like, hey, we, did, we fared well. Then, so now we have an 18-foot hole in our roof, and a lot of water came in. And that morning when this happened, um, uh, it was like, where do you start? What do you do? Because it's just pouring through the house. We put trash cans. We did the whole thing. Um, next morning, and, and I had some of you calling and checking and texting and this, that, and the other. Um, I don't know if it's the next one. I don't know. It's a blur, you know, when this happens. So, and some people are, again, some people don't even have power. Some people don't have homes. So, uh, but it still just throws you out of whack, right? Your life, your, your schedule. We have a three-year-old at the house, which he's a hurricane in himself. So having to get, you know, figure out moving a closet out and having a bathroom not functioning and water through the whole home. Um, how do we keep going about our business? So um, some of you called, and I think somehow I talked to Mike. Well, first off, Lynn. Lynn said, what can I do for you? And we were bagging up an entire closet of my clothes and, her clo- and Amanda's clothes and uh, lots of stuff in the closet. We had, we had this large closet, and the tree came in the closet. Um, so... Uh, I said, I don't know. I think at that point, I told Lynn, I don't know what, what we need help with right now. We're just kind of scrambling. And then at some point, I said, we don't have power. She had power. Y'all never lost power, Poland, did you? Scumbags. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. But, but um, I, I said, we need clothes washed because they've had, uh, uh, you know, attic all over them and insulation and, and they were going, starting to get gross. So Lynn came over and got uh, uh, bags of clothing for us and her and I think her sister helped wash uh, our clothes and, um, and, and fold and just helped us in that way. Um, and, and Mike came over, I think maybe the same day. Mike called me. He's like, what do you need? And I was like, I'm good. You know, when you're just kind of spinning your wheels and you're overwhelmed, you're like, I'm all right. I'll let you know. And then as I hung up with Mike, I said, I think I got this. Um, and I'm, I told you guys I'm supposed to have shoulder surgery on November, so I've already pushed that too hard. And, and I, I was feeling it, and Asher was helping me, and, and the family was doing things. I was like, you know what? I need to take advantage of Mike offering to help. So I said, Mike, come on over. And he wouldn't like me telling the story about him because he's a humble guy. But he just came over, and, and uh, I thought, well, we're going to hand the lots of stuff out the window. We had to pull carpet out and, and just you know, parts of the attic that were laying in there and put it out the window to help to have another hand. That's what I was thinking. And we got Asher and me, and, and, and I'm half broken, so it would help to have another hand. So Mike came over. And uh, if you guys don't know Mike, he's got the ability, um, that, and hit part of his job and his gifting is um, making messes a little more concise and, and getting productive productivity out of that. So here I am standing there, Mike's out, and I think at one point he was talking, we handed some stuff out, and he carried it to the, to the road, uh, and he was just doing it. I could tell at one point he was like, what do I do? And I'm like, well, and he's like, I'll just do this. And he starts just doing stuff. Um, and after he helped us get a lot of stuff out to the road, I don't need, it's all a blur, Mike, so I'm trying to tell the story, not remembering. Uh, we carried stuff through the window of the bathroom, tried to clean it out where we could use it and keep getting water up and all that stuff. But then he's like, what do I do now? I was like, huh, I don't, I'm not sure. And he's just started going at it. He picked up a rake and started cleaning up the front yard because all the junk we carried out of the attic and out of the closet and the, even it was construction pieces. And anyway, it was just stuff was everywhere out there. So Mike just like, he just started doing out there and he got Asher doing stuff and moving stuff. And, and um, it was the front yard is the last thing on my mind. <coughs> And so when all, at some point I walked out there and they were cleaning up the front. And again, that wasn't my priority, but Mike made the statement. He's like, you know, I just want you to have, when you pull up, so you just don't have one more thing to worry about. I could care less about the grass of the front yard. But Mike showed Jesus with a rake. 
made a dent on me more than ever hearing somebody in a Bible study. And he never intended that. He didn't know what he was doing. He was just being Mike. And Mike would never want to teach a class. <laughs> You're probably not going to have him sign up to be a Sunday school teacher, but, but Mike showed me Christ with a rake. And just cleaning up trash in the yard. I didn't think I needed it, but I needed it. And just showing up. I didn't plan to get emotional on this. Uh, it's not about you. It's just, um, and, and this isn't about Mike, and this isn't about Lynn, and so many of you have loved us. Well, it's just, you know, that, that's why, why we're here. That's why we exist. And I didn't really think about it that way. I mean, it was refreshing to see the front clean and just go, wow, at least something's in order in the midst of chaos and messes. Um, but as I was preparing this, I'm like, this is exactly what we're talking about. It's what Jesus did. I mean, with a rake. <laughs> Just minor things make large dents in people's lives. And, and as I was thinking about that, and, and it just, it, it kind of overwhelmed me. Um, and I wasn't all teary-eyed when you left my house, Mike. <laughs> it didn't make that major an impact. I was grateful and thankful but as I'm thinking about this, I'm like, this, this is exactly what God calls us to do. And some of us are like, well, I'm not that spiritual. I'm not that deep. I'm not that articulate. A rake. <laughs> Showing up. Just being there. Something. It makes a difference. It's giant. It's huge. So Mike showed the love of Jesus to me and my family with a rake. And showed my son that this is what the kingdom looks like. And he didn't, he would be, he's embarrassed of me even saying this right now, I know him. But never opened a Bible. And uh, this is the kingdom, guys. This is what God calls us to do. Lynn washed our clothes. Pastor Ken showed up on our door. Uh, uh, and so many of you, I'm not singling people out. So many of you reached out and, and this is, this is just one example. I mean, this stuff happens all the time. So keep it up. Um, and this is just my angle of one scenario in our lives. And I've seen you minister to each other. So I'm, again, I'm not going to single people out. Uh, Pat made us burritos. Burritos are my love language. You know that? So uh, Mexican food is my love language. So, uh, so this, this is just, this is what it is about. This is what it is, caring for one another. Um, checking on one another. Just showing up. That day in the life of Jesus, we see where he healed a woman, where he cast out demons. I mean, he was always doing things, touching people. And Scripture even talks about him looking at people, the value of that. It, it doesn't just, it explicitly mentions the fact that he looked at people, people that other people wouldn't look at. He looked them in the eyes, and you know what that did? The rabbi, teacher, this, this guy that was building this huge reputation, in the town, I had multitudes follow him. He'd look at the people no one else would look at, and he'd speak to them. He'd look at them. He dignified them. He looked at the unlookables. No one else would talk to. The untouchables. He dignified them. That was his life. It wasn't always just eloquent words. Sometimes Jesus didn't even say anything, but he showed up. He showed up. Sometimes, listen, church, you might get the urge, the, the umption, and feel like the Holy Spirit's leading you in a certain direction to, to go minister to someone. You're just like, I don't know what to say. I don't know, especially in times of crisis. Listen, just show up. Just show up. I heard that from a youth pastor years ago giving his students advice. He said, you know what? They had a tragedy happen in their youth group. Someone had passed away, and the kids were like, what do we say? And oftentimes people say way too many things in death. Advice, or I feel this, or I've been where you are. Just, just be there. Just show up. Hug them. Tell them you're praying for them. And like when Mike showed up on my door, I knew I needed somebody there to do something. I'll, I'll take the help because I'd be kicking myself for not asking for it. 
and just doing something. It helped immensely. It helped immensely. Just showing up. And I really believe that, let's put this into practice in our church. This is exactly what Lynn's talking about. We're getting started. We don't have all this figured out. But all of us got something to give to somebody. Just showing up. Just doing something. Sometimes we don't even realize. Uh, he didn't know he'd become an illustration in my, in my sermon. Sometimes we don't realize, and it might not be in the moment, the, the dent or the impact we made or the help that we made. We don't hear the fruit of that. And that's not what it's about. Just, just do. Just give. And you never know how God's using you. One day you will. But just serve him and have joy in doing that. Listen, when the world was under God's rule, there was no sickness, no death, no poverty, no crime, no war, no injustice. When God returns to rule, there will again be complete health, peace, and justice in the world. He's going to bring it all back. But meanwhile, while we're here, remember that dash we talked about living in? We live in that tension of the kingdom's here, the kingdom's not yet. This is us. We are agents of the kingdom, restoring it back to what it's going to be. Piece by piece. With rakes, with washing clothes, with food pantries, with activities we'll have we're here, with concerts, with Sunday mornings, with greeting people at the door. We are agents loving people into the kingdom. We are, remember, fishers of men, this process that we're becoming Fishers of men working against evil schemes. Building the kingdom brick by, by, brick, by brick. The goal of our, our living church, listen, the goal of everything is restoration. I even heard that in discipline with, with uh, I learned that from somebody wise about even discipline of your children is restoration. It's to lead them from destruction towards the path of righteousness. To restoration, restore. Even our conflict should be ultimate restoration. You hear that? Conflict with one another. Conflict with people we love. Get back to what, what's going to be new out of this. What's going to be right. Restoration. Putting together what has been broken in Jesus' name. So let me summarize and wrap this up as we're, we're coming to the end of Mark 1. So who is Jesus? He's our king. He's our king. I mean, that's been the theme throughout. He's our king. Christ, the Son of God. He's as powerful as John the Baptist said he was, was, and he would be. And he has supernatural authority over the demonic kingdom, over demonic uh, presence, over all things. In our democratic society, we're Americans. We have trouble with this. He's our king. We're individualistic. We have our vote. This is a different kingdom. He's our king. So it makes more of a fight for us to surrender. He's your king. Why did he come? To establish the new kingdom. He holds the power over the spiritual and the physical world. And you are agents as his kids, as his adopted sons and daughters, citizens of heaven to restore both the physical and the spiritual world. And how do we respond to him? Man's response was apathy. But everyone who met Jesus was amazed. And you're amazed. And even the evil spirits that were violently opposed to him shut up at his presence. We have to respond to him and crown him king. So I pray we do that this morning. I pray we recognize that uh, God has called us, as him, us crowning him king, that we're restoring the world back, both physically and spiritually, that we live lives that show his love, that show uh, that we are his in everything we do and say. If you don't know him this morning, I invite you to know him. The scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. It's to surrender, to put your life, your faith in Him. And just ask, you, ask yourself this morning, what's your next step towards Christ? What is God challenging you to do? Church, just show up. 
And I, I've walked away from times, and even this year, there was a certain moment in my life where I think I second-guessed, and I went the wrong direction, and God was saying to me months ago, just show up. Just show up. If you have the umption, if you have the pull, just show up. Uh, so let's commit to do that this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you uh, for your love. Some of us have, have um, oftentimes gone another direction because we just feel inadequate. We don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. And Lord, I pray that you would um, help us to respond to uh, those pulls in our life where you're leading to just show up to trust you for that next step. Sometimes we feel insignificant, like we're not making that big a difference. But we never know. And we don't do it for the glory, we don't do it for the fruit or what we see, we do it for you. And as we're seeing through the scripture, as you touch people's lives, you change the world. And you had these 12 men go out and they changed the world. And now you're calling us to continue to do the same. Lord, I pray we do it. I pray we do our part. May we know the joy of it. This is not a have to, this is a get to. Lord, help us to, no matter what age we are, to find our place, to love people as you love them, to dignify people, to value people, to put people above schedules. Lord, we thank you so much for your love for us. Help us to love you more. In your name, Jesus. Amen.